Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. I'm going to play the entirety of this video and then I'll go back and talk about things that are going on to better explain what's going on and talk about things that I think that were done right and or done wrong. Without further ado, here we go. This briefing will provide information about an officer involved shooting involving members of the New York City Police Department. You will see relevant video footage and other available evidence that will allow you to gain a better understanding of the events that led up to the incident and what occurred during the incident based on the facts that we know at this time. New York state law and NYPD policy give police officers the authority to use reasonable force under appropriate circumstances. The department's force investigation division conducts a thorough investigation when an officer discharges his or her firearm or in cases of any serious police related injury or death. Sometimes these investigations can require as much as a year or longer to complete. Our understanding of the incident may change as additional evidence is collected, analyzed, and reviewed. Investigators are typically required to interview multiple witnesses several times, review many hours of video footage, and analyze a significant amount of forensic evidence. The images and information you are about to see may be disturbing. When a police officer uses force to take a person into custody or defend against an attack, the images can be graphic and sometimes difficult to watch. There may also be strong language recorded in the videos you are about to see. Viewer discretion is advised, especially for young children and sensitive viewers.
New York City, 911, needing police, fire, and medical. New York City, 911, do you need police, fire, and medical? Yeah, this is uh, 947. What's the address? 947, Delegate Street. Sir, what's the address? 947 East 163rd Street. 947 East 163rd Street in the Bronx? Yeah. What two streets are you in between? Yeah, we have somebody have a gun in the store. What two streets are you in between? East 163rd Street. I'm showing Interval Avenue and Kelly Street, okay? Yeah. And this is 947 East 163? Hello? Yeah, yeah. 947 East 163? Yeah. All right. And anybody injured? No. What Maria, is he trying to do? He just, he just take the money and left the store right now. Please. He took the money? Yes. Okay, help us already on the way as we speak. Male or female? It's a man, it's a black man. He was robbing earlier the other store in the corner. Now All right, what is he wearing, sir? What is he wearing? He wearing, uh, like, a brown hoodie. Brown black. hoodie and what color pants? Yeah, brown hoodie, and uh, he's black, you know? Okay, what color pants? I don't even pay attention to the pants. That's okay. Paying. How old did he look to you? Huh? How old did he look to you? He's, like, maybe 18, 20. 18? Okay. Did he have any other color on? What color was his hair? He's, he's covering his hair with a hoodie. He's covering his hair with a hoodie and he has a mask, like a, I think a regular mask, you know, but he, he can't see his face because he's covering it with a hoodie. He has a blue mask? No, no, it's a black mask. A black mask. Okay, talking to me is not the lame police response, okay? I just want them to find the guy, okay? I need a, a description of him. Which way yeah, did he go? He pulled out the gun on my face and he takes the money and he wrote. Okay, which way did he go? I don't even know what way he goes, to be honest with you. He's going to come here and we're going to show you the camera. Okay, hold on. Like, and you said he took the money? Where did he have the gun? He had the gun, I don't know, but he, he pulled it in my face. All right, he came earlier, he came earlier in the other store. You know, in the other store, the police was in the other store, the corner. In the other, the other store. So we heard somebody arrive over there, and today, now he come over here. So he did it twice already. Okay, so he was in the corner store earlier. Yeah, and now he comes to the store right here. And this is the same building. We have like two corner stores in the same building.
He's running, Sancho. He's running. Watch it. Watch it. Watch the people. Shots fired, Sancho. Shots fired. Watch it. Take cover. He's running, Sancho. He's going up on 163 to the dead end. 163 and Simpson. Shots fire, one, two, three, and Simpson. Take cover. Keep going. Watch it, Baeza. Take cover. Coming weeks and months, the NYPD Force Investigation Division, in cooperation with the prosecutor having jurisdiction over this incident, will continue to investigate and analyze this incident as more interviews are conducted and forensic tests are completed. After the investigation is complete, the facts of the case will be presented to the First Deputy Commissioner's Use of Force Review Board, which will evaluate the evidence to determine if the use of force applied in this case was justified and within department guidelines. All right, let's get into it. <clears throat> this briefing will provide information about an officer. And so I guess it's been a minute since I've had a New York video. Um, it feels like it's been a minute. I, I don't know which episode was the last time I had one show, but I feel like it's been a minute. Uh, the New York videos are obviously uh, way different than um, any of the West Coast or 
even really any of the the southern videos new york is kind of unique in how they do their videos uh i do like the little slideshow that just kind of provides information i like reading i'm a person who i like to read stuff more than i do like to to hear people talk about it um maybe because i'm i'm just a a reader from way back i guess you know reading so many books um i'm sure there's there's some type of um um designation as a learning style for people who prefer reading versus listening but uh yeah i like i like how they put the little slides up here with all the information that i can read for myself um the beginning of the video we see the uh closed circuit television of the um security camera footage and we see the guy robbing the place and we only get this one camera angle and there's someone behind the counter that he's talking to not really sure uh, what the holdup is, but he ends up getting the help from what appears to be another employee who he gets to come over there. And then whoever's behind the counter hands this guy the cash, and then this guy proceeds to count the cash. So, not really sure if the robber told him to count it out for him <laughs> or if this guy decided, hey, I need to count and see how much money we're losing the day. That way we can tell the boss or uh tell the insurance company tell the police something I, I i don't know um i mean and if the offer the offer if the robber specifically asked him to count the money okay a little weird i don't get it but if this guy just happened to count it on his own despite being told just to hand it over well that's that's kind of a ballsy move i wouldn't recommend um counting the money to see you know how much is going to be lost uh your cash register you know when you uh start your cash register off you know you should know obviously how much you know you're starting it off at and then the receipt um roll will show over the course of the morning day night whatever uh how much transactions there were and what amounts and so you'd just be able to pull the receipt tape and be able to tell how much money is is gone from the register um taking that risk of standing there and counting it is not something that I'd, i would recommend uh, especially when someone has a loaded gun and has been uh very freely pointing it at, at you and um from the looks of it when he does point it he doesn't exercise any trigger discipline so he keeps his his uh his finger on that trigger as a resting place and when he's demanding and um, telling them what he wants, he's pointing the gun while he's doing this sometimes. And that's just an unnecessary risk. You don't want people pointing guns at you. And you especially don't want people pointing guns at you when they don't have any trigger discipline. Because then a negligent discharge could go off. So obviously don't recommend... Um, any stalling tactics or anything like that when someone's already got a drawn gun on you. There's there's not much you can do once a drawn gun is already on you. Uh, you can't outdraw a drawn gun. Uh, the only time I would recommend that you do something uh, to fight is when you are feeling that it's pretty imminent that the person's about to kill you. You know, if they're starting to um, march your ass back to the cooler or something like that that's fight time because usually when people get marched back to the cooler or marched back to the back they get around putting their head um so if it comes to something like that that's when i say you know stall or fight or something like that but something like this where you're right out there in the front um there's no sense in installing or trying to fight someone who's already got their gun drawn out on you it's just going to be more of a lose-lose situation. Now, for some of these shop owners, I can see maybe why they'd have the motivation to stall or fight or something like that. Uh, it's their store. That's their livelihood. Uh, losing all that cash means that uh, they don't get to pay rent for that month or they can't make car payments for that month. And landlords and banks are not that very forgiving. They don't give a shit about your, your sob stories or anything like that. And... <laughs> You default 
on your payments, you default on your payments, regardless if you got robbed or not. So no sense in, in, in fighting an armed robber um, when it just comes to giving them the cash. Best option is to just hand it over. I know it sucks to to give in and let the bad guys win. I hate that notion. I hate that, that mindset. But, you know, your life is worth more than the couple thousand dollars that's in the register you can make that thousand dollars back um you can't bring your life back the only time i like i said the only time i'd say to go against that is if you're being marched to the back and you think you're about to be shot dude takes money uh they call 911 of course he says this is the same guy that was down the corner yesterday um i mean that's kind of a presumption don't know really for sure if this was the same guy or not um, it's a good chance, but, uh, I mean, there's really no way of knowing. Now, one thing that I did note, let's see here, let's back this up. Okay, so officers arrived at the location four minutes later at the nine one after the nine one one call. Beza and Peralta interviewed the complainant, and they broadcasted more detailed info of the person over the radio. They been they then began preparing the necessary paperwork while other units canvassed for the person. Um, you know, paperwork can always be done. You know, later. I guess you could say, um, which, I mean, if they had enough people to obviously go out and, and, and canvas for this person and do a search, okay, maybe. Um, but, I mean, if there's not obviously going to be like a whole freaking squad of people out there looking, then if it's just going to be them and maybe one other car, I think the paperwork could could wait and they could go out and start searching immediately. You know, if this was so fresh that they they arrived four minutes later, you know, how far can a person go in four minutes, right? Like, they got to be somewhat close to the area. So I would think it would be more prevalent to go out there after meeting with the person and getting a better description, go out, do the search, spend X amount of time out there searching and then come back and do the paperwork. Like why, why are you going, why, why are we wasting our time getting there on a hot call and be like, well, I guess we'll go ahead and start taking the report now. Like, fuck that. Like that's not, <laughs> that's not putting a whole lot of effort into catching this asshole. But then again, like I said, that, you know, there could have been multiple units out there searching. Um, I don't, I don't know if that's the case. Um, but, um, Yeah. So, um, they start the paperwork and they're sitting in the car. When I guess they notice the guy and then they decide to go after him. So he's doing something on his phone and it is blurred out. And she's got the paperwork. You see it right there. He starts to. <laughs> this is kind of funny to watch. So he's sitting there. They notice it. He goes to put the gear selector in. Nothing happens. And then she reaches over and messes with it. <laughs> he gets his keys out and puts it in. And then she's still reaching over there like she's going to put the selector down. Like, uh, that, that kind of tells me that she is a fucking backseat driver. And I hate people like that. I hate when I'm driving and someone's fucking telling me how to drive the damn car. Like, I would just much rather just slam the brakes, throw that motherfucker in park, and say, you know what? You fucking drive. But that's just my thoughts on the matter. Um, I finally get them started. Start heading. Now, um... <clears throat> He does something to the uh, smart 
siren control thing up here. I don't know exactly what he does to it. Uh, they've got a um, they got a weird way of of mounting their stuff. Like this is an odd way of putting control panels and stuff. Is putting it directly on top of the dashboard like that. I mean, surely this police model Explorer they're in has a freaking console in the middle and they can mount that stuff. I just don't. That's just too much right there. And especially at nighttime. I mean, these things aren't that super bright, but still they put off enough light where that would be an annoying um, visual obstruction to me. I see stuff that New York does. Some of the stuff they do is, is just kind of weird. That and like how they do their... Their radios, their portable radios, they're almost the same as how um, places out in California do the portable radios. It's like they have no belief in lapel mics whatsoever. Now, <clears throat> he automatically gets his gun out. So, that's the right thing to do. Um, her, on the other hand, she does not have her gun out. She has radio in one hand and a fucking cell phone in the other I'll talk about that when it gets to her camera, but he automatically gets his gun out because he can see that this guy is the dude, the guy who was armed with the gun. So, gunfight happens in the middle of the street here. And, of course, the jacket covers up part of the camera. This is one reason um, why I I don't fully like jackets. And it's one of the reasons why I chose um, for winter to try out a um, true spec uh, combat, tactical combat shirt. And um, that way I don't have to be wearing a jacket. Um, I can go without because all the layering system that I have um, under this tactical shirt. This is one of the problems with a jacket uh, when using body cameras. So unless you have a mount that will go onto the jacket somehow, you can fully zip that jacket all the way up then you are left having to have the jacket on and unzipped or have the jacket on and partially zipped up until the point where the camera is at. And this is what I used to do. I would have my my jacket zipped all the way up until um, it got to my camera. And because I used just a clip kind of mount uh, on my vest, I could uh, lift forward on the camera and run the zipper up right behind the body of the camera and let the body of the camera rest back down on top of the zipper. That way, when I moved around, I wouldn't have any of this shit happen. Well, that then meant that from one point of my chest going all the way up to my neck was always left unzipped. And I don't know any companies that make it like this, but I've always thought that a good uh, workaround on that would be if a company produced jackets that had two zippers on the front that way you could uh, zipper one all the way up to your neck if you wanted to have that kind of uh, closure on the jacket um, and then the second zipper you know you can adjust it and you can have or leave a um, an, an opening so to speak um, right there in the middle of the um the the jacket that way you know your camera will be able to stick out that or you know specifically leave um a point attachment points on there to be able to put a camera now if you've got the magnetic mount of sure that would work all you'd have to do is zip the jacket up assuming it's going to be a, a lightweight jacket which this is what this kind of looks like it looks like it might be a lightweight jacket then that that's plausible that's a, a could be a workaround now if it's a thick jacket then your magnetic plate that's under your uniform shirt is not going to be strong enough to go through that thick jacket 
So you'd have to have a separate magnetic mount to work on just the jacket alone. And then you would have to take the camera off your uniform shirt, attach it to your jacket, and then when you want to take your jacket off, detach the camera and put it back on the uniform shirt. That's a lot of unnecessary shit. Um, which is why I've, like I said, I've kind of gone to the um, um, winter combat shirt. And, but that only works for me because I wear an outer vest. For people who are more into this style uniform, that doesn't entirely work for them unless they want to do the layering system under their uniform shirt. And there can be some mixed results with that depending on the shirt style and, and its breathability and whatnot. So it looks like he might have a lapel mic. You see it kind of fall right here. So he's one of the few from New York that I've seen with a lapel mic. And you can see it, you saw it pop up right there again. So it looks like his lapel mic has fallen. And that is um, possibly one reason why a lot of people um, choose not to use a lapel mic. And that is another issue when it comes to winter time. So if it's summertime, obviously, you know, you got your radio on its pouch and then your lapel mic can go up to your, um, if you're wearing a regular uniform, I can go up to your shoulder epaulet. Um, if you've got an outer vest, you can click it onto your outer vest. With them, the way their uniform styles are, um, putting a jacket on now means that your lapel mic is going to be under your jacket. So that's something else I think that these uniform manufacturers could do to um, make it better for um, using a lapel mic. Having good dedicated spots to be able to clip that radio into uh, and or having um, pass through style um sewing on or slits on the on the jacket so that you can run the lapel mic up through a slit in the jacket and then have it clipped in that way you can kind of get away with having the cord on the outside and all that it'd be kind of contained down within the um under the jacket itself um and this is also another reason why those bluetooth um mics are are pretty nice that way it would be easier when you're having a jacket or not um, you can just take the bluetooth mic and clip it to the jacket and then unclip it take your jacket off and clip it back to your shirt there is a company called mic loop that makes a little product called the mic loop and it is designed to remedy the issues of your lapel mic falling off so whether it's a wired mic or it's a wireless Bluetooth mic, you can take a, a mic loop product and attach it to the microphone and it'll be attached or anchored to your vest, your body, and it will keep your, your mic pretty well secured. There's lots of photos out there and customer testimonials using this product. There's some photos of some officers uh, covered in mud where they've chase someone and fought with them on the ground and you can tell obviously just by their looks like <laughs> they did some fighting on the ground all right uh, but their lapel mic is still in place it didn't go anywhere and that's a pretty good product and that's a pretty good solution for all these people who always have something negative say about the lapel mic like oh it always falls off okay sure yeah it can but there's a product out there that pretty much um, resolves that problem um, they're not that much and even if you're a cheapskate and don't want to buy it um, you can get some paracord um, lots of people got paracord laying around and you can fashion one yourself now of course you know I don't always advocate rolling your own gear but uh, you can do it I've kind of done it in the past with certain things but 
usually, you know, um, when people build a product, uh, they usually uh, put some pretty good craftsmanship into it. And the Mic Loop is one of those products where I think it's got decent craftsmanship into it. It's not like it's very complicated kind of um, material or putting it together, um, building it. It's just a piece of paracord sewed into a, um, a piece of Velcro, essentially. Certainly a workaround for the problem. So the guy they're chasing decides to go to a dead end. <laughs> now you can tell at this point this dude is, he's getting winded. Um... You know, yeah, sure, it's it's easy to, to run with nothing on. The minute you start putting all this heavy shit on, the belt and the vest and the and the clothing, like it it takes a toll. It really does. And um you can't run as far as hard as you could wearing, you know, just regular clothing. But you can tell he's starting to get winded a little bit. And now you know, the issue is he's lost full sight of him. Well, now the issue of uh, him continuing to run is he could be ambushed while he's running. The dude could be hiding right here and then pop out and hit him. Or as he comes in the view from the side, pop him from the side. So that could be another reason why he's starting to slow down. He's trying to be careful about how he progresses forward after losing sight of the guy. There's a woman, looks like she's maybe on this balcony somewhere or looking out a window. I can't see her. You saw someone running? But anyway, she's somewhere over there in that building. And she's pointing out to the bad guys over here. And again, the damn jacket's covering the camera. But this guy comes in and knocks him down. Oh, oh, oh. Got you, got you, got you. And they take him in the custody, which they cut the camera short so we don't get to see everything. Uh, here's the, the view from the partner. Now you can see on the window right here, uh, these are ballistic uh, panels, and I think these kind of became popular after a couple of NYPD officers were shot while sitting in their car. Um, these are just ballistic glass panels that kind of go right here to give officers better protection when they're sitting in their vehicles, um, doing reports, or just sitting there waiting for stuff. Obviously, this is where it covers. This part is still uh, non-ballistic, so bullets would easily pass through this, but where they're sitting at, their body is going to be covered at least by this portion. <laughs> I can't pause it good enough. Um, He's running. Watch it. But you can watch her hand. She's got radio in one hand and a cell phone in the other. Yeah, you can see the cell phone there. Radio here. There. So she transitioned it over. Looks like she was in the mi middle of a phone call, maybe. Um, or maybe someone's trying to call her. Not really sure. So, um... 
this is something um, that I've noticed in videos a little bit, um, and I've, I guess I, I don't recall having much discussion on it, but cell phones. So obviously, cell phones are a major part of our lives now, and I've seen videos where people are getting out of their car and they've got a cell phone in their hand. Um, some people, it looks like. Um, They've had their cell phone and they've, while they're driving, they'll tuck it uh, while they're in a seated position in the car. They'll tuck it to their uh, crotch area or, or up under a leg and keep it there. Because um, I've seen videos where they'll get out and you'll see the cell phone sitting right there on the seat. Uh, but I've seen, of course, videos people getting out of the car and the cell phones in their hand. So I get it. Cell phones are a part of our life. But I think there needs to be some common sense when it comes to utilizing cell phones when working in this style of capacity. Um, you know, and I, I've caught myself doing this too before. You know, I'll, I'll get out of the car and um, I'll usually my phone, I'll have it on a... Um, it's on this magnetic mount. So I have a, I believe it's called Night Eyes. It's a uh, cell phone mount. Uh, there's a clip that clips into the vent and it's a big, um, not a big ball, but it's like a round steel ball. Uh, steely, it's called the Steely. And, but this little clip, it clips to the air vent and there's a round ball, like the size of a, a marble or something. And then on the back of my phone is a, uh, a magnet. Um, a, uh, there's a magnet on there and I can press the phone to the little ball mount and then kind of rotate it where I want it. And I'll usually have that clipped like that to the vent in the car and then I'll have my charging cord running up to it if I need to be uh, charging the phone. And um, before I started utilizing my, um, my cell phone um, belt clip carrier thing, I forget what the case carrier i don't forget what the terminology for it is uh before i started using utilizing that um i noticed and it, it kind of made me think about it after watching some of these videos i noticed that you know i'd grab my phone off the clip on the thing um as i'm getting out of the car and one hand has a phone in it and then when i get out i would slide the phone down into a pocket and um go about you know doing my thing and then sometimes I'd have to get my phone out while I'm out doing stuff or when I go get back in the car I need to get out of my pocket before I go into a full seated position because once I'm in that full seated position with the way the clothing uh, constricts and or kind of um, uh, slides or whatever uh, it'd be hard to get the f phone out of the pocket have to kind of like wiggle around a little bit so the biggest thing that I started noticing um, or thinking about after, you know, doing that and then recognizing, hey, I'm always got this this freaking phone in my hand when I'm getting out um, and then watching these videos is that's a that's a failing point right there. Like, what if something happening as I'm getting out of the car? Well, one, um, I would hope that I would just open my hand and release that unnecessary thing out of my hand and, and get in the fight. Um, but then now I've dropped a phone and that could be, you know, my backup emergency communication to be able to get help on the way. Uh, if my, my radio is not working. Um, so I started to implement the, uh, the full phone clip thing that came with it. I, got, I use an otter box. So, you know, you get the, the case that goes on the phone itself and then you got that little belt mounted, um, holster i guess you could call it that you can clip your phone into well i mounted that to my vest and so now what i find myself doing that i think is a better way of doing it is uh before i get to where i need to be going um before stopping or whatever i'll take that phone off the off the charger if it's charging or i'll just take it off the mount and i'll clip it into the little phone holster thing and then when I get out, both hands are open. And then when I need to get the thing, it's right there on my chest. And then when I get back in the vehicle, it's still right there on my chest area, or more my stomach area. Um, it's just it's just easier for me to, to do that. Um, 
I had thought about trying to implement it somehow on the duty belt, but with all the stuff right there towards the front, there's really not a good space for it. And then even if, even if I did try to put it on the belt, it's not going to stay there very well. It's not going to click in place, so to speak. It would just kind of be like stuffed down and, and sitting there, and it would certainly easily fall off in a scuffle. So uh, the little cell phone holsters, I think, are a pretty good option. And I think the best way of doing things is go ahead and in securing that cell phone to your body instead of having it in your hand. Because obviously a cell phone in a gunfight is not going to help you at all. So you're either going to have to leave your damn phone behind or secure it on your person pretty quickly in, in scenarios like this. And again in a seated position it could be hard to stuff your phone into your pocket especially with a damn duty belt on so the little uh, little phone holster i think is a is a is a, a good piece of equipment um secondly the radio without the lapel mic again this seems to be a very common thing with nypd and lapd that i've noticed out of their videos is they just they just don't use lapel mics on their radios now, New York, I believe, is one of those agencies, obviously, that they can't issue a radio to every single officer. So these are most likely shared radios. And probably what ends up happening is these shared radios, the lapel mics, they probably get destroyed between multiple people using them. Because um, people just don't take care of shit that's not really theirs. Um, which is the whole argument behind why so many agencies have take-home cruisers. Um you know, a person's going to take care of something and if it's give it to, given to them versus if it's just a pool car and everyone else drives it, they're more likely to, you know, screw shit up. But nonetheless, I firmly believe that lapel mics are an essential piece of life-saving equipment that need to be used on portable radios. And this is a good example why. This is a good visual why. Uh, boom, gunshots are being fired and she is still trying to hold this stupid fucking radio in her hand and talk into it um, when she could just more easily reach up to her shoulder or her chest, wherever you know you clip the mic at and talk into it. And then once you let go, that's it. Like, the radio's still on you. So if she had to go to a two-handed grip, uh, what's her options right now? If this dude turned around, started shooting, and she needed to shoot back, what's she going to do? Drop all that shit in her hand and get the gun out and do a two-handed grip? I would hope so, but probably what's more likely to happen, um, which I've seen in quite a few videos, is she'll draw her gun and then try to get a two-handed grip while holding all this shit in her hand. So it just makes more sense to use a lapel mic And it's a necessary piece of life safety equipment. Watch it, watch the people. Stop. So there are people here, and of course she's yelling, watch the people, watch the people. Watch it, watch the people. Um shot fire, sensor, shot fire. Watch it. Now, I don't know who she's yelling to take cover or she's yelling to people or trying to yell to this officer. She's done something with her cell phone finally at this point. Um, she's got her gun out. Still talking on the radio. So, radio in one hand, gun in the other. Now, I don't know what that was. You'll see it in the corner right here. It looks like a, um, it looks like the cord to the lapel mic, but I know it's not. It might be a hair tie. So she might, she might have decided in the middle of this, uh, rolling gunfight to, to fuck with her hair and put in a ponytail or something. I don't know. I don't know what the hell she's doing. Um, but she slowed down enough to do this little, yeah, it's, it, it looks like a fucking hair tie. Take cover. I 
course I can't pause it hey, at the right up. moment. Ah, okay. You've seen it enough times. It looks like a hair tie to me. And then both arms appear to go up. So I'd say with pretty high confidence, she's messing around with her hair. I like how she's talking to him and he's not paying attention and she smacks his head. <laughs> that usually gets people's attention. I got it, I got it. In the coming weeks, So not much to, to show on this video. Um, I mean, they go where they respond to a robbery and dude whips out a gun and uh, shoots at him. Um, I'm not sure if this guy ended up being shot or not. Um, of course, he's being indicted for all this stuff. So it doesn't say anything about him being shot. So it seems like um, the rounds that police fired at him missed. Okay. That happens. Um, I've talked about it before in other videos. Um, I, I don't. I don't have any numbers in front of me. I don't know, like what the percentage of misses are when it comes to police-involved shootings, but it happens enough to where it's it happens. Like there are misses involved in police action shootings. Got you. Got you. Got you. Um, when you're dealing with pistols and using a pistol, short, a short barreled uh, gun under extreme stress, then there's going to be misses. You can, you can take a pistol and have great, beautiful scores on, on a shooting range under golf course conditions, but gunfights are not nice comfortable golf course conditions when you're on the range those paper targets don't shoot back in the streets targets shoot back and that changes things so that is going to increase the likelihood of misses occurring all right i'm not trying to say that it's okay for police to miss their rounds in a, in a gunfight in urban areas but I'm, I'm trying to explain that it's it's likely to happen when you're dealing with pistols that have short barrels and you are in a very dynamic and stressful situation I'm sure that they could they could punch perfect scores on a shooting range no doubt but when it hits into the streets things change a little bit now, can you increase your likelihood of not missing in the streets? Absolutely, that comes with more training. Unfortunately, agencies are not able to print money, all right? Like they don't have a tree that grows money on it at their station, okay? So their budgets are already small as it is. And when it comes to training, they don't have a whole lot of money to work with. And especially now with some places with their far left uh, liberal idiots in charge, they're fucking defunding the police. So whatever little tiny amount of money they had for training has now gone down due to defunding. And so they're not able to get adequate training um, and be proficient in firearm skills as they could be. For agencies that, that have not seen the defunding bullshit happen, uh, still, they have small budgets. And the majority of agencies in this country are pretty damn poor. Uh, there's there's <laughs> there's quite a few agencies. They can't even afford to give their officers bullet-resistant vests or buy their own duty gear for them. The only thing they're able to provide is a, a car and a badge. 
There's like, hell, oh, fuck, there's some agencies that can't even provide a badge. The officer has to buy it themselves after they get hired. Um, so when it comes to agencies like that and firearms training, if the agency cannot afford to buy you a damn badge, do you think they're going to be able to afford a box of ammo for your, your training? No, they're not. There's lots of agencies out there where officers and deputies have to provide their own ammo for qualification training. Um, or actually, I don't want to say it qualification training, just for qualifications. Uh, a lot of officers will buy ammo to go practice on their own. That is the reality for law enforcement here in the U.S. and probably in other parts of the world as well. Uh, lots of officers, when they get hired, go to the academy. Uh, they'll get a decent block of instruction on firearms training. And then past that point, uh, they're lucky if they ever get anything like that again. Uh, the bulk of what most people get after their academy is they just do qualifications once a year, sometimes twice or three times a year. Uh, sometimes they can get some force on force stuff. Uh, sometimes the, the fat simulator comes around, the thing where it looks like a video game and it's like a big... Um, a big TV um, projector screen that is scenario based and you got the little, um, little fake gun. Um, and then every so often, you know, you may have some of that more uh, intense firearms training like they would have gotten at the Academy, but that's, that's not everywhere. And that plus the fact that you have, a large number of officers in this country that the they're not gun people. They don't they before they became the police they never shot guns, um, and by them becoming the police that's the only damn reason they have a gun is because their employer gave it to them and it's kind of a condition of their employment they got to carry a fucking gun. Um, but beyond that, like the only time they shoot is when they are told they have to go shoot. They have to go show up the qualification to be able to stay employed. Uh, they don't take their gun out on their own to the shooting range and do any practice. Like they don't give a shit. Like they were not gun people to begin with. And as the police, they're not gun people. Um, there's many that don't even carry off duty. So what do you think the odds of them being able to hit a target under stress when being shot at and having zero misses is going to be? The odds are not going to be that good at all. So, anyway, long story short, misses occur in police-involved gunfights. Um, lots of reasons go into it, but it happens. Mm, not much else to say about this video. If you like what you hear and see, go ahead and give me a like and a share. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more Monday quarterback videos. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense, thank you for watching.